Hi, my name is Carlos. I'm a PhD student in computer science at McGill University. Uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, predicting small molecule binding from RNA structures. Thank you very much for having me. So um, the current state of computational drug discovery in RNA can be broken down into two major categories. One uh, we call the docking and scoring techniques, which take as input a 3D structure of an RNA as well as a ligand. And through uh, chemical and physical computations give you back an affinity. And uh, the idea is to find ligands that have a high affinity for a given target. Um, the problem is if you're trying to look through millions of compounds and thousands of targets, um, you have to repeat this process for each one of them. So it becomes very, very expensive quickly, even though you do get some significant accuracy gains. The other approach is to say, well, maybe if we take just as input the RNA and try to directly predict a ligand, then we don't have to explicitly enumerate all ligands, but we learn some kind of patterns in the RNA structure that are compatible with certain ligands. And that's what we call direct ligand prediction approaches. And InfoRNA is uh, the most notable among those. And what it's doing is uh, roughly trying to match uh, the secondary structure of an input RNA to a library of motifs, uh, structural motifs that are known to bind to some ligands. Um, and what we ask in this project is, um, well, noting that there's typically a very large gap between the secondary structure and the 3D structure. Um, we're asking if there's some better representation of the RNA that can give us more information about ligand binding um, than just uh, looking at the 2D structure. Um, and we also wanna be able to learn uh, a generalizable relationship between the RNA structure and the ligands um, beyond just doing uh, similarity matching that can often uh, boost performance. So uh, for this, we look at the extended secondary structure which essentially says uh, if we look at the way two nucleotides interact, there's more than one way that this can happen. There's actually 12 different orientations that these can be in. And if we include these into the secondary structure annotation, we get a better idea of what the 3D structure looks like. So uh, usually we think of uh, the standard 2D structure as being made up of canonical interactions. So Watson Crick, Watson Crick pairs, um, but we can actually fill it in uh, with uh, a larger range of interactions. Uh, using what we call the extended secondary structure. So broadly, the objective of our tool is going to be uh, to predict uh, from a set of RNA interactions uh, what a likely ligand is going to be. And for that, we use a tool called RNAmigos. Well, we develop RNAmigos for this. Um, so uh, we get our data. Uh, so currently, the best uh, place to get um, annotations of non-canonical interactions is uh, crystal structures and the PDB data bank. Um, and uh, I say it's currently the best because um, right now uh, there's currently a lot of work going on into actually predicting non-canonical interactions from sequence. Uh, whereas usually most tools only give you information about the canonical interactions. Um, so eventually um, applying these types of methods would give us a lot of uh, throughput for uh, screening uh, for ligand binding. So but in our case, we look at a 3D structure and we see if there's a ligand around it. And from that, we build a graph that represents the non-canonical interactions here in red and the canonical interactions in green. And right away from this one, we can see that the non-canonical interactions are actually doing a lot here to give the pocket uh, a, a unique shape. So we call this type of representation an augmented base pairing network. Um, and on the ligand side, we essentially uh, use a standard encoding, which uh, represents ligands as vectors, uh, which we use uh, any machine learning method needs to have uh, its input and output encoded in a, in a vector form. Uh, and this uh, representation just tells you for a set of fixed chemical substructures, whether your input contains it. So that gives you a set of zeros and ones, which represent the ligand. So, um, <clears throat> The idea for RNAmigos is to do a similar thing, but on the RNA side. So we want to encode our RNA in, into a vectorial space um, such that we're able to use that to predict uh, something about the, the native ligand uh, that would prefer to bind this RNA site. And I'll take you through the rest of the pipeline now. So we start by taking our input. So it's a, a set of RNA interactions built as a graph. Uh, and for each node in this network, we use something called a graph neural network um, to produce an embedding. So we can think of this as a fingerprint, which is just a vector representation of each of the nodes. And uh, from that, we want to eventually be able to predict what's the ligand that would bind to this target. And the way we do that is um, we go from a node, rep node representations 
down to a representation of the whole binding uh, of the whole binding site H simply by pooling uh, node representations. This could be done by averaging or by summing or something slightly more sophisticated. But the idea is we can boil down a set of node embeddings into one uh, representation that we could also think of as a fingerprint, not just of a ligand, but now of a binding site. And now we can use standard machine learning models to predict, to learn the relationship between uh, binding site representations and ligands. So uh, we essentially take a bunch of uh, RNA and native ligand pairs and train our network to uh, be able to predict the ligand from the ligand from the target, right? And so this uh, GCN is just uh, a function that we can train uh, until it does a good job at reproducing the native ligand. Uh, and we just note that um, there aren't very many annotated uh, or uh, RNA structures for which we have ligand information, but that doesn't mean we can't still uh, train our model. We define uh, something called an unsupervised pre-training task, which tries to encode uh, the R types of RNA structures found in, in the databases um, without necessarily relying on external labels like ligand binding. And we find that doing this actually helps quite a bit uh, to boost performance. So if you want to read more about it, you can check out our preprint. Um, and then finally, uh, so once we've taken as input our, our ligand, encoded, it, encoded each node as a vector, then aggregated the node embeddings into a graph embedding, um, then we predict a fingerprint, right? And we want that predicted fingerprint to be similar to the one that we find co-crystallized. So that's essentially the raw output of our model. And we sort of measure how good that output is in a virtual screen. And uh, that's this part of the, of the pipeline that I'll explain down here. Um, so the idea of a virtual screen is that it tells us how useful our predicted fingerprints are uh, in kind of a real world setting. So we predict a fingerprint Y hat and we build a set of decoys. So uh, it's a set of ligands D that we assume don't bind uh, our given binding site. And we add to it Y, which is the active compound, the one that does. So it's kind of like a needle in a haystack problem. Uh, and we ask then, can we retrieve the true binder in this haystack? using our predicted fingerprint Y. And the way we do that is we essentially rank all the ligands in, uh, in C uh, in our decoy set by similarity to our prediction. And if, our, if the most similar ligand to our prediction happens to be the true ligand Y, then we did a good job. And we got a high rank and we have a score close to one. If not, we have a score close to zero. On average, uh, or something random is doing a score of 0.5. So the first thing we observed is that using the augmented base pairing networks has a significant gain over using just secondary structure information. And we can further boost this by using this unsupervised learning task that we uh, briefly mentioned earlier, which is kind of an interesting method that can apply to other RNA uh, learning tasks. Um, and the rest here are controls to make sure that we're not just learning some bias in the data. Um, so it, turned, it seems like these uh, extended uh, annotations are quite useful for predicting uh, ligand binding. And then we asked, um, are we just able to predict one specific type of ligand well and we're doing a bad job on the rest? Or is this uh, performance due to a, a, a large diversity of ligands? And if we sort of group ligands by similarity to each other, so these would be kind of uh, families in these trees, um, then uh, we should see good levels of performance across the board. So uh, in these uh, little blue and, and red squares, we plot uh, our performance on each type of ligand. So green means good, red means bad. And we find usually uh, good performance uh, scattered across the board. So we're able to do a good job on a diverse set of ligands. Um, where we find uh, weak performance is over here on the left. Um, and since we have very low clustering uh, happening over here, it's usually uh, due to very sparsely populated regions of the ligand space. So um, it's probably needed, we probably need more data on this end um, to do a better job. The last thing we do is we compare our tool to InfoRNA. Um, and uh, essentially we place InfoRNA in the same setting. We ask, uh, we give it a, a structure for which we know the binding site from the PDB. Uh, and uh, we ask it to give us back its prediction uh, based on just the secondary structure and their matching algorithm. And we see if we're able to do the same thing, uh, do a good job on this virtual screen using that, uh, that prediction. And it turns out that it performs kind of close to what you would expect from a secondary structure approach uh, in, our, in, in our model. Um, and it might be suffering from the fact that it can't really generalize beyond what it sees, uh, because if we look at the types of ligands it does a good job on, um, it's, you can see that they're very confined to a specific region. So it seems that uh, it might not be able to generalize outside of what it's uh, been 
strictly uh, in its uh, matching set. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, this, this was the closest comparison we could make. So it has to be taken with a grain of salt because uh, there's many, many differences between the tool uh, and the type of data that uh, they're built on. But it's just to say that uh, it's very likely uh, that these types of uh, edge annota uh, base pairing annotations are going to be very important if we want to find very uh, specific compounds for our RNA targets. So just to summarize, the lessons uh, that we uh, take out of this is that we can learn from uh, complexes to predict ligands. Uh, so we propose the first uh, fully learning-based approach to do this. Um, and we find that uh, graph convolution networks and unsupervised learning techniques can really boost performance and help us deal with complex RNA structures. Uh, and finally, we find that um, augmented base pairing networks that take into account these uh, additional geometries are the only level of uh, structural information that was sufficient for uh, having reliable predictions of ligand binding. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank uh, all my lab members, uh, co-supervisors, and uh, funding agencies. Uh, please feel free to contact me with uh, any questions. Thank you.